Okay everybody, thanks for logging on and uh, checking out this video. This video is designed for those of you who are going to be facilitating an off-campus small group, the first one of 2014. So if you're an adult small group leader through Day Springs Ministry and you're going to be leading a small group using the handout that goes with the January 5th sermon, then you are in the right place. I'm going to talk you through the handout just to make sure you um, you know, have a good understanding of what's being communicated there to kind of help you facilitate the small group discussion on this particular week. So go ahead and get your copy of the handout. You should have a copy of it by now. It looks like this, and I'm just going to talk you through it point by point. And uh, you can make some notes as I move along, and maybe that'll help you out as you facilitate your small group this week, all right? So let's look at it together. You notice you've got seven uh, discussion points there, and uh, you know sometimes you make it through all of them, sometimes you don't. This week you probably will, um, but let's talk through them piece by piece, all right? Number one, it says to read through 1 Corinthians 11.26, talk about what hit home with you from Sunday's sermon. Now, just so you'll know, if you're watching this prior to Sunday, um, on this Sunday, you're going to notice that there's kind of a theme going on in, in our church, which is the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper is one of those two things, we call them ordinances, two ordinances that Jesus established before he left the earth, things that the church would continue to do all the way until the time he comes back. The two ordinances that we recognize are the Lord's Supper and baptism. And in that sermon, I'm going to be talking about the ordinance of the Lord's Supper because what has happened is that throughout time, I believe some things have changed in our understanding of the Lord's Supper. You know, change always happens in society. Sometimes change can be for the better. Sometimes change is not for the better. And in the instance of church life, I think the change that has happened in, in terms of the way that we approach the Lord's Supper, I don't think it's been a good change because we've lost a lot of the meaning. So in that sermon, I'm going to be talking about the various ways the Lord's Supper has been understood throughout uh, church history, and hopefully we can recapture that. Um, you'll talk about that in discussion point number one. You'll be recapping that. And if you are um, going to be facilitating this small group, I encourage you to actually take some notes in that service. There'll be three kind of main points um, or key points that you can maybe write down. That way, when you get to this discussion point number one, you can kind of help prompt everybody if they didn't write some notes down. But it's about the Lord's Supper and, and some of the lost meaning of it. This small group lesson that you're going to be facilitating it's going to be talking about the ordinance of baptism and how we've lost some of the meaning there. Okay, so that's what this small group discussion is going to be about. Look at discussion point number two, and it pretty much says that. It says, just as the modern day church has lessened the meaning of the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, the same can be said of the ordinance of baptism. And, if, uh, and here's the question that you ask here. If someone were to ask you what baptism means, how would you answer? So allow people to go ahead and begin to discuss that. And this isn't one of those times where you're kind of, you know, necessarily looking for a right or wrong answer. You're just allowing people to articulate and, and to begin to discover that maybe we haven't thought through the meaning of baptism, or maybe our, our understanding of baptism isn't complete. So discussion point number two, you're getting the ball rolling. That's where you transition from this whole thing of, you know, yeah, we have not maybe rightly understood or fully understood the Lord's Supper the way we that we ought to, and now maybe the same is true of baptism. So what you have over the next three discussion points it's kind of an outline form. Three things that the early church all associated with baptism and uh, things that maybe we ought to as well. So look at them. Discussion point number three. It says, consider a few things, of, uh, meanings of baptism that the early church held dear. Here's the first one. The baptism was a symbol of how God changes people. Now at this point you have some passages that you're going to read together as a small group. And what you're going to discover is that the, the New Testament church they connected the picture of death, burial, and resurrection with baptism. So in essence, baptism was a, a physical illustration. You know, it's almost like a, a reenactment of death, burial, and resurrection. So you should notice that. So for the early church, when they would say, okay, what's the meaning of baptism? Basically, they were making a statement about Jesus, number one, that he was crucified, buried, and raised to life. Being baptized was a way of affirming that, saying, I believe this. But it's also a picture about our own death, burial, and resurrection. And you'll see this in the passages that you read there in discussion point number three. A reminder that we, our old self, has died with Jesus. But we've also been raised to live with Jesus. We've been given new life. So baptism is a symbol of that. And you know, a thing that maybe you could talk about here is, um, you know, it's kind of like a wedding ring. Uh, a wedding ring is a symbol 
of being married. It doesn't make you married. It doesn't make you unmarried, but it, it's a physical demonstration of that. Baptism is the same way. We are publicly identifying ourselves as people who believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and therefore have been raised to walk a new life ourselves. And here's maybe a kind of an extra question that you could throw out as a facilitator at this point. You might say this, hey, if baptism really is really a public proclamation, so to speak, it's a reenactment, it's a, it's a declaration of the gospel message, death, burial, and resurrection. If it is indeed a declaration of the gospel message, what does that imply about how and when or maybe where we should be baptized. Throw that out there. And, and really kind of what I'm fishing around for here as I, as I throw that out to you is, if it is a gospel statement, if, if baptism is a gospel statement, then perhaps we should be baptized publicly in front of people, especially people who um, need to hear the gospel. And I would even contend that maybe we should be baptized the way that we do it at Dayspring, by being put on, all the way under and all the way up, if indeed we're trying to send out that message that our old self is completely buried and that we are raised up with Jesus. So throw that out there. You know, if if this is indeed a symbol, a reenactment of the gospel itself, then then what does that imply as to how or when or where we should be baptized? All right, that's a good extra question that's not on your handout. Um, look at discussion point number four. Here's the second. Here's the second thing that the, the early church connected with baptism, and this is one, one of the ones that I think that we've lost. Um, it says baptism was an association with the family of believers, and you've got some passages that you can read there that talk about that. And here's basically what this point is making: when a person is baptized, think of it like this: in, in our modern day culture, in in the fall on Saturdays, when you walk around Mobile, you see people dressed. In team colors. Have you ever noticed that on Saturdays in the fall? A lot of people wearing crimson and white. A lot of people wearing orange and blue. A lot of people wearing red, white, and blue for South Alabama or whatever their team may be. A lot of people wear their team jersey to do what? To identify themselves with the team that they pull for. Think of baptism kind of like that team jersey. When you're baptized, you're kind of putting on that jersey of saying, I am identifying myself with the one who was crucified buried and raised to life. But here's the thing. You're also identifying with all the other people who are putting on that same jersey, right? You're saying, hey, we're all in this thing together, just like, you know, fans on Saturday may see each other wearing their team colors and you kind of give a nod or a thumbs up to somebody. When you were baptized, you were not only identifying yourself or associating yourself with the one who was crucified uh, and raised to life, Jesus, you're also identifying yourself with those others who have been raised to walk a new life. So baptism is really a public statement saying, I belong to all of these people. We are a spiritual family. So here's another question that you may throw out as a facilitator that's not on your handout here. You may point out the fact that if baptism identifies me as part of the spiritual family, maybe as part of your discussion, hone in on that word family. And say, you know what, if we're really a spiritual family, what are the implications of that? I mean, if we're more than just people who show up at the same building, if we're more than just people who confess the same thing, if we're actually united as a spiritual family, then what ought that um, do to us? What ought to be some outcomes or experiences that we have? So you may talk about things like connectivity um, in terms of our, our affection that we ought to have for one another, accountability that we would have with one another, um, the determination to stick with one another through good times and bad, just like family does. So there, there are some extra dialogue that you can have here that's not pointed out in your, um, in your, your discussion guide. But the point is, if baptism is a public statement about who I, I associate with and who I belong to, that's a meaning that we ought to hold dear and when we see people baptized, it ought to mean something for us because those people are making a statement that they now belong to us and that they are with us and for us and um, as part of our family, okay? So that's an association that probably for baptism has been lost a little bit. That's a change that's not so good. And then number uh, five on your handout, here's a third thing that the early church connected with baptism, and I think you're probably going to go, wow, I think we have totally lost this meaning of baptism. Look at it. For them, baptism was an invitation to suffer with Christ. 
and then you have a passage there to read in Philippians chapter 1. Um, you'll notice that that passage in Philippians 1 isn't a baptism passage, but it is a passage that talks about how we are to live a life worthy of the calling that we've received, that the way that we live we're basically, it's a life that, that um, affirms the, the high calling of, of being a follower of Jesus. And baptism is a statement that's, you know, that's an initial statement of saying, yes, I'm accepting that call. So here's what I want you to understand about this point on discussion point number five. When it says that baptism is an invitation to suffer with Christ, here's what that means. When someone in the early church was baptized, it's as if publicly they were raising their hand and saying, I'm willing to, to do whatever it takes to advance the gospel, even to suffer. Now, the reality is, the American church, we don't suffer, quite frankly, the same way that the early church did. We don't suffer, quite frankly, the way other Christians around the world suffer. But here's the thing of it. Suffering um, can be understood a couple of different ways. You have the intense form of suffering that we're familiar with. Those who give their lives for the gospel, those who are physically beaten. That's the kind of suffering that we, you know, when we hear that in the Bible, that's what we think of. There is a lesser degree of suffering that still holds the name suffering, and that is when we suffer loss. And oftentimes that's a thing that we do on purpose. You know, this other one comes to us and we don't necessarily choose that or want it. Suffering loss in the sense of, I'm willing to give up or forfeit things that I could otherwise enjoy. I'm willing to give away some things that I could have held on for myself. That's a form of suffering. It's a lower degree of suffering than this other, but it's suffering loss. And here's the thing. When we make that decision to follow Jesus, in essence, what we are saying is, I'm willing to give my life and live my life for the advancement of the gospel, even if that means suffering, whether like this, you know, whether like this or like this, I'm willing to suffer for the gospel. And here's the thing with the early church. When someone was baptized, that was their way of formally making that statement. I am willing to pay the price. I'm willing to go the distance. And I don't know about you, but I think that meaning of baptism has been watered down, pardon the pun, um, in our culture. I don't think that when we see people baptized, there's that strong emotional tug of saying, man, that person, that person right there being baptized, they are signing up even to suffer. But that is a meaning of baptism that the early church held. And quite frankly, I think it's one that we need to recapture. So uh, baptism is an invitation to suffer for, with Christ. So you look at those three statements. A symbol or a picture, an illustration of how God changes people. An association and or commitment to, to the family of God. And an accepted invitation even to suffer for the advancement of the gospel. As you look over those, look at discussion point number six. It says, look at those three meanings again. And at that point, you're going to have to kind of let people look at them again. So this is a moment where the, you know, there may be some silence. But look at those three meanings again. Which one captures your attention? And have people at this point discuss. Um, have them discuss which of these meanings maybe have you never thought about associated with baptism or which one have you never connected with baptism. At this point, you're letting people talk about it. And this should be a moment where people start talking about how a light just came on for them. About how, wow, I've never really thought of baptism that way. But... What a meaningful thing, and you're going to be connecting all of these scriptures with it and all of those. So um, let people say that, and then look at verse, uh, again, at discussion point number six. It says, look at those three meanings, which one captures your attention, and then it says this. Do you have a baptism story? And if so, share it if you're willing. Uh, you may have some people talk about how and when they were baptized, and you may have some who, who have a testimony of being baptized maybe really early as a child but not understanding the meaning of it. And then they were baptized later on in life as an adult, now that they understood the meaning and wanted to do that. You may have some people share those stories. And here's something that may be of help to you as a small group facilitator. If you have people in your group who start saying, well, you know, I've never been baptized or I've never been baptized with any meaning attached to it and I would like to. One thing that you can encourage them to do is to follow through. We have a baptism class coming up in January. Um, it's the last Wednesday of January. You can encourage those folks to go to that baptism class. They'll get all the information they need, and they can participate in the next baptism service, which is the first Sunday of February. So as you lead this discussion, it very likely may prompt some people's desire to follow through and be baptized. It may do that for you. Who knows? Um, but if that's the case, point them to the baptism class that we're going to be uh, having at Day Spring at the end of January. 
And that's pretty cool to think about the fact that maybe out of your small group discussion, somebody might be moved to action and you can help them follow through immediately, even this very month, all right? So this is our lesson. We're just trying to recapture the meaning of this beautiful ordinance of baptism that, that God has set forth. And after this Sunday, we'll have done the same thing with the Lord's Supper. So it's going to be a, a really cool thing. You'll notice you got a memory verse at the very bottom. That's your last discussion point, of course. And listen to this beautiful verse. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Hey, thanks for uh, tuning in. I hope this equipped you a little bit to lead the small group discussion. Watch it again if you need to. But uh, you guys have a great small group, and we'll see you Sunday.